go. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Johnson. I'm with Coleman Consulting Group. And uh, with me today, I have Wilma Torres and Erica Brewster. And this is an encore presentation of a program that we offered with Charles uh, about a month ago about maximizing revenue in primary care. So we varied the time to see if it would be more appealing to clinicians before they start their day. And so terms and conditions, you know, we always have to get these housekeeping things uh, out of the way. Uh, hopefully nobody else is recording or photographing any portion of the presentation, but Charles is recording it so it will be posted and you'll be able to view this again. And again, especially if you can't sleep at night, definitely I recommend. Uh, better than Ambien. So Wilma uh, is a certified coder. Her experience is in internal medicine and cardiology. Uh, she handles a lot of our physician coding and billing projects. Erica is also a certified coding professional with uh, 15 years of experience in all aspects of healthcare billing. And my background is more on the managed care side and uh, risk adjusted reimbursement, which is another aspect that we all work in. So our objectives for today are to look at some ideas for generating revenue in primary care. We will look at some of the nuances of telehealth um, explore some billable services that some providers may not be aware of and may not be maximizing. We'll look at three programs that you should implement or consider implementing, if not this year, definitely for next year, and take a, a fresh look at some of the tried and true, some things that maybe we take for granted that also impact revenue. And then the last thing that we'll do is spend a little bit of time talking about some ICD-10 changes for 2021 that go into effect on October 1st. And so with that, I'm going to hide the video so that you can focus on the slides. We will have uh, two question and answer periods during the presentation, but you can always use the chat box, which Erica is watching, and so she will keep track of any questions. Anything that we don't answer, we can send to you after the session. In addition, we will make available and send to you a packet of reference materials that have the codes and um, different parameters of the things that we're going to talk about today, some templates and forms uh, and reference info. So you can either put your email address in the chat box or send us an email and we can get that out to you. The first thing we're going to talk about is telehealth, which is all the rage, obviously, uh, because of COVID, and it's been well received. In fact, I can't imagine a time where we'll go back to no telehealth or how it was before. Um, however, we've seen some uh, misunderstandings in the way that telehealth can be used. For example, some providers are under the impression that all of telehealth can be done via audio only. Others believe it's audio and video, and it's actually a mixture. There are some services that can be delivered via telehealth audio, so telephonically, and others that need to have a video component as well, and we're going to look at those. Obviously, telehealth expanded a great deal during the public health emergency, and depending on what source you uh, look at, you'll see a couple of different dates for when the public health emergency first came on the scene, March 6th, March 1st, March 13th. Um, but Medicare has made these services, um, has approved these services widespread since March 6th. Medicare covers and defines telehealth as those services that would normally be provided in person but are conducted via some type of telecommunications technology. So video chat uh, can be anything like Skype, Zoom, uh, what we're doing right now, or FaceTime, and then telephonically. Telehealth does not include solely email. There are a couple of services that we're going to look at that you'll see uh, are available asynchronously, so by email or through a portal. New and established patients may be seen via telehealth. It's important, though, that the clinician document clearly the method of the telehealth visit. So was this audio only or audio video? They also must document the location of, where, of the PCP and the patient during this visit. 
It must be expressly documented that the patient gave consent to having a telehealth visit. And if there's anyone else present, a family member, a caregiver, that individual should be identified in the progress note for the visit. Uh, one of the issues that we're running into is on the Medicare Advantage side, these visits must be audio and video, and sometimes the documentation does not make that very clear, which means that any of the information uh, transmitted in an encounter for a managed care plan will not count because of the video component being absent. One of the things you'll see during this presentation are these little symbols. These are our telehealth symbols and we will let you know which of the services we're talking about are audio only, so they'll have just a little telephone, um, or audio and video for which you need then the two components in order for the information to be billable as a telehealth service. Telehealth codes, well, everybody is familiar, all providers are familiar with the nine, with the ENM uh, level codes, 99201 to 205 for new patients, 211 to 215 for established patients. And we've included in all of our tables, the payments, the Medicare payments for um, Dade Broward, Palm Beach, and then all the other counties. The important thing to understand about this particular slide is that early on with telehealth, providers were billing these codes. And um, they are not correct codes for telehealth at this point. The place of service you'll notice is place of service 11. So it is the uh, provider's office where there was some disconnection that in the past it was recommended that providers use place of service 02, but that is not correct. The other thing to keep in mind is that there's no deductible or coinsurance applied if any of these services are COVID related. But on April 30th, CMS released some new telehealth codes, and these are the codes that should be used now when a clinician delivers a telehealth service. The phone codes uh, are the 99441s, 2s, and 3s that you see on this screen. The payments are the same as the ENM payments, so there's no loss of payment there, but the codes need to be uh, different than the ENM codes that you saw before on the other slide. And then there's a different set of codes for non-physician practitioners with obviously the small, the lesser reimbursement. If you did uh, bill any of these services with a place, any of the telehealth services with place of service 02, you need to appeal those payments because they shorted you and owe you money. And if you need any additional information on how to initiate that appeal, I know that we have a blog about it on our website and you can also call our office or email us for more information. So hopefully everybody's clear that these are the telehealth codes that need to be used for telephonic visits. Another type of visit included in the telehealth umbrella, sort of, is the virtual check-in. This is a patient-initiated interaction with the office. It's a spontaneous interaction. And uh, CMS allows a broader range of methods than just phone or audio video. And that should say audio slash video, sorry about that. So they can use secure text message, even a patient portal to communicate with your office. The one caveat is that a virtual check-in cannot be about anything related to a medical visit that occurred in the last seven days or anything that leads to a visit in the next 24 hours or as soon as available. It can be used for new and established patients and obviously medical necessity always needs to be documented. But when there are these spontaneous types of questions, perhaps a medication issue, wanting uh, some advice, these can be documented and billed as virtual check-ins as long as they have that asynchronous um, not as long as, and they can have that asynchronous component. So they can be done in real time, telephonically, audio, video, or they can be done via some other uh, non-real time mechanism. So it, that makes them a lot more convenient, even though the reimbursement is not too great, these things do add up. And remember always to document that the patient consented to this interaction with the office.
Something else under uh, telehealth is the online digital E&M visit or e-visit. This one is also patient initiated and it, it, it occurs through the portal. The payment for this has, uh, includes reviewing the inquiry from the patient, you know, if the clinician has to access any records or data in order to be able to answer or address the patient's concern, um, perhaps coordinating anything about the treatment plan, communicating back with the patient. There are no restrictions like there are for the virtual check-in in that it doesn't matter if there was a visit set, uh, within the last seven days or um, a visit within the next 24 hours. This is the appointment and it's an appointment that, ha that happens asynchronously, so not in real time. The patient sends you an email through your portal um, and has a question, you have to do some research and uh, get back to the patient or some coordination, you document all of that and can bill for those services. You'll see on this table that um, the codes are laid out for clinician, for physicians and then for non-physician practitioners. Again, some of, this, some of these uh, payments are not huge, but they do add up. And there's a lot of back and forth, especially with patients being very conservative about coming into the office, that you can still deliver high quality care and get paid for it. This is a regular visit because this is the visit. And the fee covers seven days of communication with the patient about that issue. So if they email a couple of times and need clarification, just document those activities and they get billed one time uh, covering seven days of interaction. It's also important, I wanna make sure that, that we're all clear that this is about the provider's time only. The provider may interact with the staff about some coordination, but the staff's time is not included in the time component to select the code. Next is the annual wellness visit, which we all know is a yearly visit with the PCP for preventive screening and wellness purposes. What some clinicians may not know is that annual wellness visits can be done telephonically. Um, I think that's exciting because we know a lot of clients have challenges in getting their patients in uh, within the guidelines that CMS has for the annual wellness visit. And so the flexibility of being able to accomplish this all by telephone removes some of that barrier and makes it possible to still focus on your patient's wellness. You can see that the uh, payments are listed there on the screen. And uh, the only other thing that I will suggest is the patient should self-report some of their vitals, which is important for the clinician to document. And hopefully you have a good mechanism for tracking when patients are due for their annual wellness visits. And you can kind of create a campaign where you complete these by phone. There are some new remote monitoring codes that we're not going to go into great depth here. Um, definitely call us and we'll give you the information and, and explain a little bit more. These remote monitoring services need to be obviously medically necessary because everything with Medicare has to be medically necessary. And there are two ways this happens. One is um, for specific equipment that might measure specifically BP or pulse oximetry, weight, respiratory flow rate. There's a component for the clinician to um, educate the patient on the use of this specific equipment and CMS has guidelines for that. And then the device is the one that supplies the recordings and the information to the clinician that the clinician reviews. The other aspect of this new remote monitoring is that um, there is one for self-measuring blood pressure. Again, using a specific device that's within uh, CMS's parameters, the code includes educating the patient and calibrating the device, but then the patient self-reports the readings and the provider reviews. So sometimes providers want patients to keep a blood pressure log. And uh, this is one way for you to be able to review that and also get paid for it. So definitely give us a call, drop us an email, and we'll be happy to explain all the ins and outs of that and send you information so that you know if it's something that you want to undertake. The next section that we're gonna talk about is screenings. 
And some of these may be things that your office is doing routinely and others you might not be and might be missing out. So we, want, we picked out the ones that we don't see a great deal in physician charts when we do audits. And so the first one, well, hang on, before that, we're gonna talk about health screenings. We know that these are from the US Preventative, Preventive Services Task Force. And some of these screenings are included in value-based purchasing programs. So you are rewarded for attending to these um, screenings and promoting wellness within your patient population. The first one we'll talk about is the alcohol misuse screening. Medicare covers an annual screening, <clears throat> sorry, uh, for patients uh, under the age of 65. If they are women, do they drink more than three drinks at a time or seven drinks per week? Of course, during uh, this pandemic, I think a lot of people have probably fallen into this category, right? Or men more than four drinks at a time or 14 drinks per week. And the Journal of the American Medical Association defines what is a drink. Over the age of 65, you can see the guidelines there. And so CMS not only pays for clinicians to screen the patient about any potential alcohol misuse, but then you can also deliver counseling. There is a, um, a form called the Audit C Screening that is recommended. We have that in our packet that we can send you. And either the patient can fill out the form or someone can ask the questions of the patient. It contains um, nine questions, things about how often do you drink alcohol, how often do you have six or more drinks on one occasion. So it asks specific questions and then there's a scoring process. But basically, if the patient does meet the criteria, then you can provide some counseling. Up to four brief counseling sessions are covered in a, in, uh, a year. The counseling is done in the PCP office by a clinician. So this is not a staff thing. But the nice thing is, is that it can be done by telephone. So you can screen the patient by phone and also deliver the counseling by phone. Um, CMS always adds this little blurb about the patient must be deemed competent. And so one thing to think about is if your patient has been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's disease, we uh, strongly suggest that you document in the note that the patient is competent despite these diagnoses to um, participate in the screening and to receive the counseling. The counseling, that uh, CMS requires follows the five A's model. And many clinicians are familiar with this. Uh, first step assessing, so talking about the behavior with the patient, advising, then getting agreement where both parties agree on what they're going to tackle and how. The clinician offers assistance and then arranges for whatever is needed, the support, perhaps uh, medication, anything like that. This model is rooted in behavior theory, and it's important to, to look at this closely because when we read progress notes, we see counseling, but it's in the form of handouts or templated language. And this type of counseling goes beyond just giving the, paper, the patient a, a piece of paper or sending something and saying, here, do these things. So it has to be documented. And hopefully by following these steps, there is more likelihood that the patient will change his or her behavior which is what everybody wants. So the billing aspect, um, as I mentioned, there is a code to bill the screening and then each of the counseling sessions up to four sessions that may be delivered in the year. And again, these are uh, or can be delivered telephonically, which is a boon right now. So yeah, we figured if you, if you had a patient that met the criteria, delivered the screening and the four counselings, it could be up to $134 in payment over the course of a year. The next screening we're going to talk about is cardiovascular disease risk reduction, which Medicare covers. Um, there are three aspects to this uh, type of screening. The first is encouraging aspirin use as appropriate conducting a blood pressure screening, and then delivering intensive behavioral therapy counseling, which is dietary, um, to be able to help the patient lower any cardiovascular risk. 
Um, we want to remind you again about the five A's from the U.S. Preventative Task Force. That is the basis for the education. These educational or counseling sessions are based on a 15-minute um, session. And one of the things that we suggest is using the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association risk estimator. This is for patients who do not have cardiovascular disease at present. It's a, it's a nifty website and you input or your staff, the patient's age, gender, race, blood pressure, cholesterol, answer a couple of questions. It's all on the screen here. And the uh, calculator gives you a, um, a percentage, which is the patient's risk, cardiovascular disease risk. And the U.S. Preventative Task Force recommends interventions, in other words, counseling, when that risk is above 10%. So this would add some heft to your documentation um, supporting the need for the CVD counseling. Remember to document the five A's and that the counseling is covered as one session per, per year. And um, it's important to keep in mind that this counseling does not impact your e &M visit level. So you can't bill for the counseling and then also use those counseling minutes as support for a higher level visit because it's included. Just thought I'd mention that. Medicare also covers an annual depression screening, which most people know, but a lot of providers don't bill for. So the screening is done for patients uh, who well, it's payable for patients who don't have a diagnosis of depression or major depressive, de depressive disorder. Um, it's done using the PHQ-9 form, and we have a copy of that in your packet, or your EMR may already contain a template for it. And um, one other caveat is that it's included in the, in the first annual wellness visit and the welcome to Medicare visit, but subsequent subsequently it can be done at another visit. And the little telephone reminds us that this screening can be done telephonically. So it can be um, something that if you are tracking your annual wellness visits and you have a subsection of patients who are due, you can do some of this by phone before the visit. Keep in mind that if you do diagnose depression, at the visit as a result of the screening, then you would not bill for the screening because it would be included in the ENM level uh, visit. But here is the payment for the depression screening. And again, it's something that providers do routinely. So hopefully you're billing it. And if not, you will be after today. The next screening we'll talk about is the obesity screening. CMS does pay for counseling for patients who are diagnosed with obesity, and they define that as someone with a BMI of 30 or more. And the way the counseling works is in the first month, the provider can deliver one face-to-face -face visit per week. The little telephone on the left there reminds us that we can do this telephonically. Then after the first month, for months two through six, one face-to-face -face visit, or telephonic visit every other week. And at that point, you rescreen the patient. So if the patient has lost at least 6.6 .6 pounds in the first six months, the clinician can deliver six more months of counseling at one per month for months seven through 12. If the patient did not lose the 6.6 .6 pounds, then you wait another six months, reassess the patient, and can start the cycle all over again. This type of counseling can be done by a non-physician practitioner. And uh, even if the weight is documented, you might wanna get a new weight from the patient so that you can document it in your um, visit. So if you're doing some of these visits telephonically, you can ask the patient and really should ask the patient to self-report their weight. The type of counseling is called intensive behavioral therapy. It's the same one that we just looked at for the cardiovascular disease risk. And so the five A's, remember, to document those. And over the course of six months, 
if you provide this counseling as uh, CMS laid it out, it's another $400 in payment. And if it's over 12 months, it's almost $600. Another screening is prostate cancer. So Medicare covers annual prostate cancer screening. We know that clinicians routinely do PSA tests and digital rectal exams, but they may not be doing them at the same time and then billing the code. Obviously this can't be done telephonically, but um, for if the, if the visit includes a digital rectal exam and the PSA test result is not documented in the note, you can order it same day, and we would suggest that you hold your claim until the result comes in, which should be a day, two at the most, and then you document it, add it as an addendum to your visit, and then you can, you can bill for the prostate cancer screening code. I think this is the last screening that we'll talk about is the sexually transmitted infection screenings or STIs. So Medicare does cover annual counseling for patients who are at high or increased risk for um, specific behaviors that can lead to sexually transmitted infections. And here is a list of some of the multiple sex partners, sex under the influence of alcohol or drugs, et cetera. These can also be done telephonically. So the screening is asking the patient about his or her behaviors and documenting them, and then uh, providing the education and the skills training and how to change their sexual behavior for the benefit of their health. So that's what's involved in this particular code. Um, an e &M code would not be billed if the sole reason for the visit is doing this counseling. But you would use a V code, V69.8, which is other problems related to lifestyle, in order to bill the code for the counseling. And here's the information on the counseling. Two 20 to 30 minutes, so these are um, a little bit longer than the counseling sessions for obesity and cardiovascular disease, face-to-face um, -face or telephonically, as we can see, per year, directed at education, helping the patient develop the skills, practice those skills to change their sexual behavior. Again, we strongly suggest avoiding generic templates and handout types of things because it takes about 20 to 30 minutes is what has to be documented. So we suggest that you create a little program of what you discussed with the patient and document accordingly. And I think this one is the last one, is the smoking cessation. So there is counseling that uh, covered by Medicare to help patients stop smoking. Two counseling attempts can be tried per year and four face-to-face -face or telephonic sessions are included for each attempt. So basically you could deliver up to eight counseling sessions per year for patients who are interested in stopping their smoking. So there's no requirement for the five A's on this one, um, but those are good because they are recommended by the U.S. Preventive Task Force as instrumental in changing patient behavior. So consider documenting the five A's anyway. Here are the two codes. You've got uh, one code if your counseling is three to ten minutes, and then if you go over that, then you have uh, you can bill a different code. One attempt or up to four sessions probably represents about $67 a year in, um, in uh, payments and about $135 for the two attempts that are allowed by Medicare. Um, did Let's go through the in-office services and then we'll stop for some questions because we can cover this one fairly quickly. These are services that we know providers do, but they may not be billing or billing them correctly. So for example, CMS covers blood sugar and A1C finger sticks done in the office. The blood sugars are covered for diabetics, or patients with impaired fasting glucose or some other things like, for example, uh, tuberculosis, CAD, seizures, alcoholism, 
chronic infections. If a patient is stable, they will cover, um, which is defined as, hang on just a quick second, two consecutive A1Cs that meet their treatment goals. If the patient is stable, you can still do these finger sticks to check their compliance. And if the patient is unwilling to test, you can still do this up to four times a year. A1Cs can also be done via finger stick, and these are used only for monitoring and not for diagnosing the patient with diabetes. But again, even if the patient is stable, it can, they, these can be done twice a year. And if the patient's blood sugars are uncontrolled, either high or low, then there can be up to eight tests administered in a year. The important thing to consider is, number one, documenting the medical necessity, of course. And second, that individual treatment goals are important here because we know that it's not a one size fits all, but some patients may, high, may have a higher treatment goal than others. So please be consistent in your treatment goal. But again, you may not be doing this and might want to start. PT by finger stick is also covered by Medicare, even if the patient is self-testing. So it's covered if the patient is stable um, every two to three weeks or more often if medically indicated and you would document that in the progress note. But it's also covered for patients who um, have other conditions like heart failure or PVD or cirrhosis. Again, documenting medical necessity, but these can be done quickly during an appointment. EKGs, okay, sounds like a dumb one to include, right? Because everybody knows about EKGs. But you'd be surprised how many provider clients um, don't bill for them because they're not sure about the rules. Sometimes they're paid, sometimes they're not, and they just stop trying to figure out the system. So routine EKGs are not covered, but if they're medically necessary for a new patient or a pre-op, they are. They're also covered and payable for patients who meet other criteria, like perhaps they have cardiac disease and signs and symptoms, or they're on specific cardiac meds, or you're checking their status after specific treatment. You can see some of those on the slide. So definitely, um, we hope that you're billing those, and we'll be happy to send you the limitations and the guidelines to make sure that you don't waste your time billing for something that's not going to be paid, but that you don't leave anything behind either. So um, the it, important in my notes, I'm looking here, EKG is included in the annual um, wellness visit, so you would not uh, bill for it. Spirometry. We're seeing some providers offer in-office spirometry testing, and uh, primarily these are managed care providers who are checking the status of certain conditions, but Medicare does cover PFTs when they're medically necessary, and that can be to monitor, monitor pulmonary disease and different types of treatment if the patient comes in with symptoms or worsening symptoms. It may be worth the investment to your practice to purchase uh, the equipment to conduct pulmonary function tests in the office. Um, on the screen, I've listed the payments, and uh, we ask that you be mindful of the calibration of the equipment, follow the manufacturer's guidelines, but it might be something to add to your office services. And lastly, just as a reminder, we're coming up on flu season. Um, Strep tests, influenza tests, dipsticks, these are all things that are billed. So you can bill and get paid, just remember to adhere to the guidelines. So with that, I guess we'll stop for a second, Charles, because I can talk and talk and talk, you know, and see if we have any um, questions. Yes, uh, well, I guess, Alex, a lot of that really is, let me throw my picture on here so people don't think I'm a talking head. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, let me, uh, I guess it's a lot of good information. And, and part of the, the I, I, you see the telephone, that type of thing. How does that work? I think a couple of things, and you mentioned it uh, somewhat, is a differentiation between these other billable things like the EKG and your normal visit. Are there any others that you've gone over that are already included that can't be billed in addition? And if, you and if the EKG is in addition, if somebody goes in for a visit 
afterwards, let's say they're not feeling well and they, and they put an EKG on them, are they able to bill at that time if they meet the criteria? Erica can add to this, but yes, if the patient is having symptoms and the so, clinician documents the medical necessity, they can definitely bill. I think yeah. where some providers kind of got in the weeds is thinking that there's something like a routine EKG that's done once a year just because it's part of the checklist that we do for an annual visit. That is not covered. I got you. But okay. If, if there are specific criteria, absolutely. Yep. Right, Erica? Yep, you got it. Perfect. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, ben, I know you're out there. Kenneth, you got any questions? No? Uh, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll um, take advantage of the, the time here real quickly. Um, Alex, I remember hearing a while back that reimbursement, I, I mean, I guess if you have to look at the silver lining for COVID, one of the things that it's done is really catapult telehealth to the forefront, especially at a time when you know we're looking at shortages of, of primary care providers. Uh, but I, I thought I had heard that the, uh, the leveling of reimbursement between in-person visits and telehealth occurred over the past couple of months. Is that here to stay or is that only temporary? The definitive word that we've heard is that it's temporary, but there's a lot of conversation about making it permanent. I've not seen, I don't know about Erica and Wilma, I've not seen anything that says absolutely it's here to stay, but it seems almost to be a train that's taken off that everybody has admitted there's no way to put the train back in the station. I mean, this is a convenience for patients, for providers. Um, it results in patients getting care that they perhaps would have delayed or canceled otherwise. And so I don't see them going back on this. They may refine the criteria for a telehealth visit, because of course, soon after that, we started to see uh, cases of the OIG, you know, of fraud in telehealth. So you know how it is, there's always somebody trying to game the system, but I don't see it going away, to be honest with you. I think, I think part of that was, uh, was started out with the, uh, by DeSantis putting out the emergency orders over the state, which included telehealth. And, and the reason why, uh, and, and I'll jump into a little bit of my other, my other side of the business is a cannabis business. And one of it is telehealth visits for renewals that's in the emergency. Same, I think it's the same order. And that order expires, I believe, sometime the beginning of November, unless the emergency order is extended. Mm -hmm. So part of it, it has to, the law has to be passed by the legislature in order to happen, or else it will expire if DeSantis does not extend the emergency order for the state. That's the way that that's the way I I see it right now. Am I correct, Alex? Is that correct? That's what I've heard. And of course, yeah. depending on who you ask, the the emergency is here uh, to stay forever. Right. And but, others but, say no, it's winding down. So. But but it's it's all the governor. The governor controls that 100 percent. If he extends the order, uh, then it's here. If he doesn't extend the order, telehealth could be gone at the beginning of November. Tomorrow, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's really the governor's purview because Medicare is a federal program. I think it has to do with the president extending the public no. health emergency. Well, again, for Medicare could, to cover it. I, it could be different, but I know in the state relating to the medical marijuana thing, it mm -hmm. all the televis telehealth was all state related. So I think right. there, I think there's a tie in there to emergency. I'm not sure. You may be right. I'm not sure. Well, the 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 medical marijuana is state based, based on the right. states that right. have that approved. But right. um, for CMS, it's federal, and I think it really does rest with the president. Right. Okay. But you know right. what? When we send out the packet, we'll um, include a blurb on that and yeah. let you know for sure. Yeah, because again, the Medicare or Medi Medicare program is actually paid by the state. Am I correct? Is that no, correct? the Medicare program yeah. is paid by the paid federal, by the federal government. government. Not, okay, by federal, okay. So it could be, could be. Medicaid is paid by the state. Exactly, right? okay. exactly. Okay. okay. All right, live okay. and learn. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so are we good with the uh, questions? So I think we can move on? I think so. Okay, so see you all in a bit. All right, next thing we'll talk about is a couple of programs that if you don't have in your practice may be definitely worthwhile considering. And one is a chronic care management program. 
This has been deemed a critical component of primary care, um, obviously for patients who have multiple chronic conditions defined as two or more, and who may require a little bit more coordination and management of their treatment plan in order to stay well, stay out of the hospital, achieve better health outcomes. The, uh, a chronic care management program can be delivered by physicians or non-physician practitioners. And in terms of the Medicare beneficiaries that fall under the CCM umbrella, they would have two or more chronic conditions that can include hypertension, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, arthritis. Uh, there's a, a long list of conditions that would fall under this program. And these are patients who are at risk of decompensating, landing in the hospital, obviously, significant risk of impairment to their health or even death and that their conditions require a lot of coordination. These patients are probably see, seeing multiple specialty providers, and so the communication needs to be managed, uh, make sure that there are no duplications in treatment, things like that, nothing falling through the cracks. So you can establish a program and um, staff it with trained individuals who can deliver this coordination. You would obtain consent, obviously, for the, from the patient, to participate in CCM, but the majority of CCM is delivered by telephone. And it really does decrease um, a lot of the things that are costly to the Medicare program. And even extending it to all of the patients in the practice, including the managed care, can be very beneficial. Um, if a patient has not seen their PCP within the last year, then there is a face-to-face -face visit required to initiate the treatment plan and that is a billable service. So some guidelines for a CCM program, the clinician has to have a certified EHR, has to create a comprehensive care plan with some measurable goals for the patient, provide access 24 seven to either the clinicians or the staff. And this can be anything from uh, telephone, messaging, internet, even asynchronous, so emails or portal messages. Um, and the whole goal of this, of course, is to manage these transitions, make sure that the patient um, is, there is a seamless coordination of the care. And here is some information about the, the uh, billing for CCM. It's based on 20, a minimum of 20 minutes per month. And then there is a code for additional 30 minutes. And so um, the EMRs that have a CCM component have a mechanism where staff members can document their interactions with the patient. Did you go to the cardiologist? What did he say? Uh, blah, blah, blah. And they document that and assign a time value. And then this is billed at the end of the month based on how long the interactions were. Supplemental insurance does uh, cover the. Um, deductible and coinsurance. It's not too difficult to implement. We suggest that if this is something of interest, you can run reports from your EMR based on patients that meet those criteria and, um, and then develop your protocols in the office. We'll be happy to help you or give you any ideas. Just feel free to call us. But keep in mind, this is something that can be done largely telephonic. Another uh, program that has some confusion attached to it is transitional care management. This one is uh, solely about ensuring or facilitating the continuity of care when a patient is discharged from an inpatient stay into the outpatient world. TCM covers a 30-day period, that first 30 days after, admit, after discharge, and it requires a couple of things. One is interactive contact with the patient, which can be telephonic, within two days of discharge, and then a face-to-face -face or telehealth visit within seven days or 14 days of discharge. And this is to perform a medication reconciliation, go through the information from the admission and start to incorporate that into the outpatient treatment plan. Please note that our symbol changed. The uh, telehealth visit for TCM has to be either face-to-face -face or audio video. And the discharge can be from a hospital, including a psych hospital, a long-term care hospital, a skilled nursing facility, or even inpatient rehab. 
there is different type there are different types of coordination so reviewing all of the admission information any follow up tests that must be coordinated education to the patient and the family this is all documented and then TCM is billed at the end of the 30 days because all of those services are included and then there are also some staff services because the staff may be uh, coordinating with other agencies or community services on behalf of the patient, different types of resources. Um, and so we hope that this is something that you understand and are billing correctly. If you're having any issues and want to discuss, please feel free to call us. A couple of things to keep in mind, only one healthcare professional can bill transitional care management. So. Um, make sure that nobody else is doing it as well. You bill it one time at the end of those 30 days, and then if there are other E&M services delivered to the patient within that period, you can still bill for those. But anything related to the admission um, that's documented would be included, any of that coordination. If you did, if the clinician did the discharge visit in the facility, then you wouldn't start TCM on that day. I think I covered pretty much everything. And here is uh, the information on payment for transitional care management. Remember, it requires communication with the patient within two days, and that can be by various means. And then a visit, either seven days, within seven days, or within 14 days, and then any other coordination. Plans of care, another one that's kind of like low-hanging fruit that providers may not be fully uh, taking advantage of. Plans of care are for patients receiving home health or hospice services, and physicians can bill just for signing the plan of care. So they review it. Uh, the home health agency does an assessment of the patient, prepares the plan, and sends it to the clinician for review and signature. And there are codes for billing if it's a new plan of care or if the patient has had uh, home health services and is now being recertified for another 60-day period. Both are billed on the date that the physician signs the plan of care. And here's a little example of a plan of care. You could probably see those in your sleep and the payments associated with just signing those. The second aspect of plans of care is that home health patients, depending on their health status, of course, and the type of care that they are receiving, may require a, a, a certain amount of physician supervision and interaction over the course of a month. If there are a lot of orders to uh, adjust, uh, changes within the patient's treatment plan or changes within the patient's um, health status, if the clinician spends 30 or more minutes per month, then, or a non-physician practitioner, you can bill for care plan oversight. It, this is a monthly service. It's not duplicated with things like um, chronic care management, obviously, but it does add up. And a lot of times there is a great deal of coordination. It just needs to be documented. So it's billed per calendar month and you document the services and the time spent and you bill at the end of the month or when you've accumulated the 30 minutes of services. It is billed by the same provider who signed the plan of care, so keep that in mind. And here, no, there is no here, there's another slide. I didn't realize that care plan oversight also applies to hospice patients. It's not very frequent, at least that we've seen, but there are PCPs or non-physician practitioners that act as a hospice patient's attending physician instead of the hospice assigning a physician. So if that individual has been identified by the patient at the time of the hospice admission as being their attending physician, then that individual can also bill for care plan oversight. And here is the table for the monthly payment. This is based on one month of services documented, or 30 minutes services documented over the course of a month. We wanted to just briefly touch on a couple of E&M things to just remind everyone because we see providers working very, very hard. And it's important not only to work hard, but then to work smart and not expose yourselves to recoupments where your hard earned money kind of just goes away. So we want to make sure you keep the money that you earn. 
And um, one of the interesting things, CMS keeps track of how many pay, uh, claims are paid incorrectly, uh, overpaid on an annual basis because they're trying to do better in educating clinicians and um, being consistent in applying their own criteria as well. And they estimate that for last year, a billion dollars in overpaid or erroneously paid claims occurred for established patient visits and another almost half a million dollars for new patient visits. And these are strictly about E&M errors. And so we know that there have been guidelines since 1995 or 1997 about documentation of E&M, um, the components of the visit to justify the E&M visit level build, but there still occur a, a large number of errors. So we thought we would go over this really quickly before we get to the ICD-10 changes for next year. I did want to point out that overcoding and undercoding are like two sides of the same coin. We've seen providers intentionally undercode because they think that, well, if I bill everything as a level three visit, then I'm not going to raise any flags. And that's not correct because it's just as wrong to overcode a visit as it is to undercode what you have legitimately done in the services that you have provided. So the key is to document them in a way, pardon my phrase, that is bulletproof um, and that will stand the test of scrutiny from any regulator. Just as a reminder of the different elements, if you need a refresher, we'll be happy to do that. But in the interest of time to leave some uh, time to discuss the ICD-10 changes, we just wanted to kind of review that there are components that are required for your history, your review of systems, uh, past history, exam, decision making, all of these get synthesized into the level of the visit that you are going to report. So making sure that you report the relevant history based on the patient's complaint for the day, meaning the reason why the patient is being seen, these things have to correlate in the same way that if the patient is coming for a low level issue, we wouldn't pull out all the stops and do this very comprehensive exam and history on everything under the sun without documenting the medical necessity. If we go just by what the patient is complaining about and the, the reason for the visit, there would be no reason to do all of these extra um, elements that are not related to the need of the visit. I think I'm kind of talking in a circle, but I think that you understand what I'm saying. So the reason for the encounter drives everything else and re is reflected in the number of components that will be documented in each of these areas that eventually makes its way into the selection of the code. And so we know that the time aspect has to do when more than 50% of the time of the visit is spent in counseling not counseling like cardiovascular disease risk and those types of things, but other types of counseling related to the visit and that chief complaint, then those can uh, support a higher level e &M code. Just a reminder of medical decision-making, which can be a little bit of a, a squishy concept because it has to do with, you know, the complexity in establishing and managing the diagnoses, like the number, the type, are these new conditions versus uh, already known conditions, how much data the clinician is reviewing, um, and all of these things, again, flow out of the chief complaint. So just a reminder. Last word, CMS does have something called an E&M interactive worksheet which is an online tool where your billing staff can enter or click the different aspects of your progress note and kind of verify the e &M level that you have put on your note as the clinician. So it may be worth it to spot check a couple or if there are some that are unusually high to make sure that they, uh, you have documented all of the required criteria. 
Quickly, we just wanted to remind you that accounts receivable management is crucial because all of these things that we've talked about to generate additional revenue kind of fall flat if your office does not have a robust system for keeping track of your accounts receivable. So I look at accounts receivable reports and they kind of look like um, all of the sand. Yeah, it looks appropriate. I see a lot of sandy sand, but how often do you drill down kind of scavenge among the sand uh, mountains to see what's in those reports because that's where the gold is, right? So some things to think about is how did, was your fee schedule established? Because if your fee schedule is very, very high, your AR is going to be inflated. So when you look at those reports, you need to create that mental discount. Um, you're not owed what's on that report. You're owed a percentage of it based on how much you, um, how high your fee schedule is. Looking at the aging categories and percentages, industry experts say that no more than 10% of your accounts receivable should be over 120 days. So who is checking, who is doing the follow-up and making sure that you're paid for the hard work that you're doing? What about patient balances? In, in this day and age where uh, patients may have higher cost sharing, what is the office protocol for initiating payment plans and holding patients to their payment plans, checking those patient balances before the next appointment? What, what is the status of denials in your practice? How, what, how many are received and how timely are they worked? How are write-offs accomplished? So does your staff have the ability to write things off that aren't paid or do you as a clinician review those and approve those? Um, just questions to ask yourself. And finally, who's checking the coding? Because with the emphasis that the federal government has placed on proper coding, looking to recoup monies that have been paid incorrectly, you need a system in the office to make sure that all the services were properly documented and billed and that nothing was left out and that any uh, overpayments are being promptly returned. So with that, we'll go into real quickly ICD-10 changes. There's not a lot for 2021. Please keep in mind, not a lot that impacts primary care physicians. Um, keep in mind that this, it goes into effect, these changes go into effect on October 1st. And even though there are a lot of changes, some new codes, revised codes, the majority of what we've seen is geared primarily to coders and specialty physicians. But um, a couple that are interesting and important to primary care physicians are this exclusion that COPD with acute lower respiratory infection and influenza virus with other respiratory manifestations was excluded from several codes. Now, the only time that you would not document or code COPD with lower respiratory infection or influenza virus with respiratory manifestations is for these three codes. So there was a softening of the criteria allowing clinicians to um, also document and code uh, COPD and influenza virus for um, other than acute nasopharyngitis, pharyngitis, and tonsillitis. Not a big change for you. Um, CKD, the, we know that there have been historically six uh, levels of chronic kidney disease. There's a change for 2021, and this one is important because N18.3 chronic kidney disease stage three now has been split into three codes. And so um, please make sure that you uh, document accordingly. If you know that the patient has stage 3A or 3B, you would use those codes. And if you're not prepared to make that leap just yet, at least make sure that your EMR has the correct codes for 2021 and you're reporting N18.30 because otherwise your claims will reject. Um, headache, the headache code has been expanded. Used to be one code for headaches. Now we're going to be a little bit more um, in depth about the type of headache. Um, headache with the orthostatic component has one code and if not, the headache code went from R51 to R51.9. The same exclusions apply except that if a patient had, for example, trigeminal neuralgia, you would either report the trigeminal neuralgia or the headache, but you couldn't report both. In 2021, you will be able to report both if they're both relevant and properly documented on the progress note. Um, 
Another important change is the addition of the vaping related disorder code. So for patients who are using e-cigarettes, uh, vaping, however you call it, um, there is a specific code for that in addition to the instruction to code other manifestations that grow as a result of that lung damage or lung injury. So with that, uh, we'll wrap up. Please request your materials packet. We'll also send you a coupon in case you'd like to um, have any type of uh, program. And so today's objectives, I think we met them. We talked about telehealth, additional billable services, the three programs, looked at the tried and true, and reviewed the ICD-10 changes. And so we thank you for your time, and we turn you over to Charles. Well, Alex, uh, once again, that was a, an excellent presentation. Uh, whether you are a physician and a physician assistant, uh, administrative person within a doctor's office, or somebody who actually deals with physicians or management of physician offices, it's an excellent presentation and things to keep on top of mind as we move along this year uh, and into next year. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions. We're looking at chat box. We really don't. Uh, okay. I bet, uh, Kenneth, do you have any uh Final questions you might want to uh, pose to Alex and her crew? Uh, I do have one, yeah, if I, if I have the chance. Um, sure. I was just kind of curious about technology. So the platforms that are now being used for telehealth, you know, I remember a, a while back there were some, some concerns as far as um, hacking and just security um, for PHI. How ha is that being um, sort of, is, is there somebody who's sort of overseeing that or what's, what's that shaping up to look like as we move forward with the different platforms that are being used for, for telehealth? Well, you know, I've, I've read a lot about uh, the fact that some of these systems may not be HIPAA compliant, but those concerns, I guess, were uh, set aside. And I think I remember reading that there would be no... Um, the Department of Health and Human Services would not be looking at any cases where um, somebody alleged that, oh, their privacy was violated because they used Skype or whatever. But I know that it is front and center to be looked at, especially because it really does look like telehealth is here to stay. And because it's been so widely accepted that there are the different platforms are looking at how to boost their security to keep patient information safe and all those communications safe from hacking. I'm not an IT person and um, I know just about enough to be dangerous. My solution is reboot. Whenever you have a problem, just reboot, it'll fix it. Um, so I don't know that I'm the best person to answer your question because we don't, um, Erica, have you read anything no. different? No, no I read the same. I think part of it is since we are still operating under the emergency order, a lot of these situations have been waived. But I think if, should, if we come out of the emergency order and you go into legislative, I'm sure there's going to be criteria for these companies that have to prove compliance and security. But I think right now with the emergency order, a lot of that has uh, not necessarily been enforced or right. worked on. So. Yep. Yep. All right. But certainly for people in the technology field, I think the sky's kind of the limit going forward. Right. Yeah. And, and there, were, there are a lot of companies right now uh, developing uh, uh, remote, remote patient monitoring systems. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see by the presentation, that the amount that you're able to bill uh, is substantial uh, and give right conditions, whether it be chronic or out of a hospital for remote patient monitoring, where it becomes beneficial for a, a physician to do this uh, because it, is a, it, it brings income into the practice where you weren't able to do it before without telehealth. Exactly. Yep. Thank you. Excellent presentation. I really Thank enjoyed you it. very much. Thank you. Okay. All right, Alex, uh, Erica, Wilma, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. And uh, we will... Uh, we were planning another one of these probably in the next month or so, probably in a couple of months, right before the end of the year to kind of give you an update of what's going on for 2021. Yes, so again, the AM changes. Right. Alex, thank you very much. Thank Erica, you again, Charles. So thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.